to our broadcast today for African Heritage Month. Our theme, as you know, in the spirit of Njia and search of the way we must be every day. We welcome today Dr. John Henrik Clark on the question of a proper education. Good morning, Dr. Clark. And welcome. Good morning, and thank you again, because this subject is endless, a proper education. And this is something that we have been missing, and maybe we have been pursuing hmm. an education this is not only not proper, but it does not lead us to where we say we want to go. Dr. Clark, on this Brown versus Board of Education decision, which is being uh, talked about today, and, and, and people are discussing it from a historical perspective, uh, do, what do you see as the significance of that particular moment in time where we are moving towards integration and what now looks like it became disintegration? It, um, uh, the significance of it is really how it started and I was uh, a schoolboy in Columbus, Georgia when I noticed the progression of it because black teachers uh, was making $48 a month at a time when white teachers were making about three times more and this whole thing started with the request for equal pay for black teachers and it developed into a request and a demand for equal education. Now that's the basis and the background to um, the, the decision in Kansas that ultimately led to uh, facsimile desegregation. I say facsimile because there are probably just as many segregated schools now as as then. That's what they're finding out. And exactly. most of them are in the north. Exactly. <laughs> right. Precisely. I found that in, in Columbus, Georgia, where I grew up, the schools are more successfully integrated than in New York City. And they've integrated the uh, the teachers on on all levels, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the, the best black teachers sometimes uh, you know, integrated right straight into the school. But I find in some places they've taken the best black teachers out of the neighborhood of black school to teach the whites, and they've dumped mm. the lesser white teachers into the black neighborhood. Mm. This is in the north, but in the south, the black neighborhood gets some of the best black teachers and some of the best white teachers. In fact, the South have done a more intelligent job than the North and a more honest job. Mm -hmm. I think the North has done a very dishonest job of integration of the schools and they really hadn't integrated them. They're just a new form of management. What we have to understand is that in the North and in education in general, it's not about education. It's about control mm. of a multi-million dollar industry. Mm -hmm. And while big business is concerned, a master plan is to keep blacks out of the decision-making apparatus. Mm -hmm. And they've been more successful in the North than in the, in the South. Mm. Dr. Clark, we... Um I, I guess if if we look at this this period, as you just mentioned, it leads up to Brown versus Board of Education, and then this, I guess this other issue underneath that of integration uh, versus our own separate communities or schools, there seems to be based on the lack of success, a place where we seem to have gone wrong in our approach to education. Um, we're going to take a break for a moment. But when I come back, I, I want you to talk a bit about our approach and. If there were mistakes, if we can identify mistakes, what were they, and then how do we get on track at All this right. particular time? Very good. We'll take a break, and we'll come right back. Dr. John Henry Clark is with us inside of the GBE, the Global Black Experience for African Heritage Month. There is more to come from 1190 to Choice. This is Imhotep. Stand by. There's more after this. Hey, Dr. John Henry Clark, our dialogue today on the question of a proper education. Dr. Clark, we were talking just a few moments ago about this whole idea of the possibility of where did we go wrong uh, in our approach to education. Uh, is it somewhere located in the integration integrationist period, or is there another place it begins? And perhaps, again, more importantly, how do we get on track? We asked for the wrong thing. We shouldn't have asked for integration. We should have asked for quality education in our own community. 
And once we had quality education in our own community, we should have strengthened our own students so that they can leave our community with the strength and the confidence to compete with any children in any school, any place. Mm. They could go into Harvard, clear conscious that they're equal to anybody at Harvard. Education, as I've often said, has but one honorable purpose, one alone. Everything else is nonsense. And that is to train the student to be a proper handler of power. Mm. That is what it's all about. The handling of power and authority. And the essence of power is the ability to include and to exclude. Mm. This decision that we made, we made after so many had come forward with philosophies and perspectives that would have indicated a different decision at that point. Yes, we wanted to become a part of somebody else's thing other than to create a thing of our own so good other people want to become a part of our thing. Yes, yes. That's basically why we went wrong. Mm, mm. Why did that happen? It's because uh, we were so insecure with ourselves. Hmm. We retreated from ourselves instead of building on ourselves and becoming more secure within ourselves. Now, now Dr. Clark, one would look, and, and, and you know this history as well as anyone, and I'll just pick a, well, I'll pick three figures. Um, Booker T. Washington. We misunderstood him, still do. He was about self-reliance. And self-reliance is about nation. A whole lot of people was about the reclamation of nationhood, which is something that slavery and colonialism took away. Had we listened to Booker T. Washington, even if we listened right now, he was leading us back to nation responsibility mm. by leading us to community responsibility where nation responsibility starts. We, we, we segue from him to, of course, uh, someone who had great respect for him and who followed in his footsteps to a certain extent, Marcus Messiah Garvey. Who was also leading us to a higher aspect of the same thing. And Du Bois... You know that's where I was going next, right? It's leading us to a consolidation, a political consolidation of the nation game. So, Dr. Clark, there was no contradiction between Booker T. Washington, Marcus Garvey, W.E.B. Du Bois, Elijah Muhammad, and Malcolm X. They were saying the same thing using different situations and different words, and they were all leading us back to the reclamation of nation that was taken away from us in the 15th and the 16th century in the rationalization to justify the slave trade. With that kind of path, and you've laid it out beautifully, I, I'm, how do we wind up making the decisions that we did? I mean, looking at the 50s in particular, after that line that you're just describing, moving from the 50s to the 60s with that kind of backdrop, historical backdrop, how do we wind up making the decisions we did on this we issue? We misunderstood our own direction and we misinterpreted our own great messengers we settled for being the assistance in somebody else's thing other than to build something of our own among the seven books I've written since I've been blind I have one that's in preparation of being published at Kent State called who betrayed the black, who betrayed the African world revolution in six other major speeches. Mm. And I outline the, the betrayal of ourselves with the civil rights movement, the Caribbean Federation concept, and the African independence movement. I explained that during the civil rights movement, we asked for the wrong thing. And we let black entrepreneur, both black entrepreneurship disappear in the black community during the civil rights movement. The little black grocery stores, the little black butcher stores, the black tailors began to disappear during the time when we were searching to be a part of someone else's thing and forgot to maintain that element of a nation within our own community, the elements of self-reliance within our own community. In the Caribbean island, the whole argument over federation 
not being able to get together. Mm -hmm. Those islands. Mm. They forgot that if you put the Caribbean islands together, you got a major collection of people who could have an army, an air force, an economic mm. system, mm -hmm. all mm -hmm. of that. But they begin little petty arguments over where the slave ships put them down without remembering where the slave ships took them from. Mm -hmm. Now, in Africa itself, the Africans did not build and do not have now a single African state. Every state in Africa is an imitation European state because the first generation of Africans educated before and after independence had African bodies in European minds. Mm. Those African bodies in European minds are still in charge of Africa. And they're not leading Africa back to Africa. That means back to the best of African tradition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That means to do this, you have to seriously question the application of Islam, Christianity, and Judaism to Africa. And I don't mean discard either one, but give an African concept, an mm -hmm. African interpretation of them, and don't give a damn who don't like it. Mm -hmm. If it serves Africa's purpose, you could care less mm. who don't like it your interpretation of it. You're listening to Dr. John Henry Clark. We're at 692-9542 and 1-800-332-1023. I want you to know that you can call to talk with uh, Dr. Clark this morning. Again, 692-9542 and 1-800-332-1023. It's African Heritage Month. We're dealing on the issue and question of a proper education. Uh, where do we go wrong in our approach to education and how do we get on track? Let's pick up on that point, Dr. Clark. How do we get how on track? How do we get on track? that we make an inventory of every single item that goes into the maintenance of a nation and make sure we have at least 10 persons already trained to maintain the nation and these 20 in training to take their place in case they fall out. Mm. We, let, let us study the rise of modern Japan. I have no romance about Japan. I know they're yellow races. But they did something we still have to do. They took a people from the bottom and brought them to the top. Mm -hmm. And they survived defeat and two atomic bombs. Amazing. Yeah. Because they did not let their enemy take away from them what was taken away from us. Their religion, their concept of nation, and they were not physically taken from their home. Mm -hmm. And the enemy did not take from them the most disastrous of all things were taken from, from us. The concept of God as we envision him to be. Mm. They took, they stripped us so spiritually that we dare not address God in an African language. And we dare not imagine God as looking like somebody in Africa. Mm. The disaster that hit our minds yeah. was over and above that mm -hmm. of other people. Mm -hmm. Now, when you take about entrepreneurship in our communities, I mean, the, the East Indian, the Chinese, everybody can come in our community and build a store. They came out of a society where they saw stores being built and run by people that looked like them. Mm. When we had stores being built and run by people like us, we bought the integrational bit and thought, well, we'd be just as well in somebody else's store, somebody else's restaurant. All those nice little small hotels used to be in the black communities. What, what, when the, during the age of integration, Duke Ellison and his band would stay there or stay in black boarding houses. Sometimes you have to take about three boarding houses to take up the band. Mm. Black uh, religious conventions would stay scattered through the neighborhood. No hotel would take them. The, hotel, the community was converted into... The, the, these, these black hotels were clean, the small, and small. And the sisters would set a plate before you and make other people apologize for cooking. It was so good. <laughs> <laughs> so, those, these little hotels, these hotels were worth keeping. Mm -hmm. So all you had to do in so-called integration is to upgrade them, not destroy them. Mm -hmm. All of them out of business now. Mm -hmm. you, right here in Harlem, when 
when I came here in 1933, because nobody wanted, wanted to admit that they were that old. But <laughs> <laughs> there was restaurants stayed open all night. And you could get good fresh vegetables and food at 3 o'clock in the morning. Well served. Walk in the street, down the side street. It was safety. Things were reasonably priced, but that's about all you had. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I ran a restaurant myself on Lenox Avenue called the Big Buffalo, where the nickel stretches. <laughs> <laughs> Almost in the same identity as <laughs> Silver's is right now. <laughs> <laughs> that's rough. Let me let me mention to those of you. I, when, I, when I when I mentioned the fact that people could call Dr. Clark, they lit up all the lines. So we we got them standing by. Let me bring some of them into the conversation. You're listening, of course, to Dr. John Henry Clark. The dialogue today on the question of a proper education. In this instance, uh, how do we get on track? That idea that you talked about, Dr. Clark, about uh, recognizing the essence of those areas which are involved in building a nation is a very critical point. That seems like something that, that, as you said earlier, if education is, is really, in essence, about that, if we were doing that, then we'd be on the road to rebuilding a nation. Yeah. Mm. You're inside of the GBE with Dr. John Henry Clark. Hotep, and good morning. Yes, good morning. Good morning. Yes, good morning. Um, good morning to you, um, Gary Bird. Mm -hmm. I'm Dr. Clark. Yes, sir. Uh, the thing I want to ask a question about is, uh, see, I believe that we are the chosen people of the Lord. Right, which is the, the Hebrew Israelites that the Bible speaks of? Uh, could you could you um, expound on that? Or, I'll or, expound on it quickly. Dismiss it quickly. Hmm. I don't believe in the concept of the chosen people. I believe this is Jewish mythology, and to say God chose one people over another people, you're saying that God is ungracious. And God discriminates. God is a bigot. I dismiss the concept. Black people have just as much right to belong to the Hebrew faith as anyone else. And black people belong to it before the emergence of a people from Europe called Jews. The word Jew is a European word. It did not apply to the Hebrews of the of the Western Asia, these of the Bible, and there's some serious question whether these people are white at all. There's no proof that they were. Now, why can't people belong to something without saying, we are the original, we are the chosen? Why must anybody be the chosen over another people? Why can't all of us be equal in respect and in, and in dignity? The concept of a chosen people came out of Jewish mythology. Mm. And I say that mythology is to be enjoyed as mythology mm. and, and not as truth. It, it perhaps it gives us an opportunity, Dr. Clark, of segueing into some concerns that you have on, on the issue of Ethiopia as well. I mean, Ethiopia has been literally destroyed before our eyes because Ethiopia... Ethiopia, not Egypt, is the senior nation in Africa. Mm -hmm. The people who farmed Egypt came down the Nile from Ethiopia and the Sudan, bringing a civilization already full grown. There's always been an effort to destroy Ethiopia. Now, recently, Ethiopia was destroyed from a small nation called Eritrea, financed by North African nations, mainly Libya, and, and Arab Islamic fundamentalists who intend to Islamize Africa are destroyed. Not a single black Muslim had one word to say against it or analyzed it in any way or understood the move historically. They forgot that Islam was nursed in its cradle in Ethiopia because when the prophet's father was about to be driven out of Ethiopia, being driven out of Arabia, two Ethiopians, advisor to the prophet, Zaid bin Harith and Bilal, advised the prophet to send the key figures of the faith to Ethiopia for a haven. And he told them, Go to Ethiopia, go to that righteous nation where no one is wrong. 
And they went there and sought a haven in Ethiopia and was accepted by Ethiopia already a Christian nation by five or six hundred years. And when he, he said that Ethiopia, Islam will never forsake Ethiopia when Ethiopia is in, in distress. No nation in, in Africa has suffered more at the hands of Islam than Ethiopia. No nation is suffering more at the hands of Islam right now than Ethiopia. But the blacks who are Muslims, who are poor readers, who know nothing, who know nothing about Islam historically, will not read a book such as the book I just wrote an introduction to last year called The Arab Conquest of Egypt, uh, J.C. DeGraff Johnson's chapter on the subject in his book... Uh, African glory when the Romans were in ascendancy in North Africa and spoiling Christianity because they couldn't manage it and when an Arab camel boy called for reform failed to get reform called for a new religion and the new religion was Islam the Africans thought that Islam would get the Romans off of their back they were right Islam got the Romans off of their back, but Islam replaced the Romans on their back, and Islam is still on their back. The Africans do not understand that nearly every organized religion in Africa is the religion of a conqueror. And the blacks who belong to Islam, and they have every right to belong to the that's what they want to do, mm -hmm. but I wish somebody, at least one person who belonged to that religion, would sit down and read a serious book about it. Because I see universal ignorance of the faith. Mm -hmm. And it's about, they want to Islamize Africa or destroy it. We'll take a break, and we'll come right back. Dr. John Henry Clark is with us and back with more of your telephone calls for African Heritage Month from 1190 The Choice, right after this. Kings and queens and kingdoms, paint a picture of the past. Let's talk about and sing about the greatness of our life. Life. As quickly as uh, possible, we only have a couple of minutes before we go to news at the top of the hour. Go right ahead, please. Good morning. Yes, greeting in Hotep. Yes, sir. And to Dr. Clark. Okay. Greetings. It is an honor and a privilege to be able to address you over the Latimer today. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to say um, happy African Heritage Month, and I'd like to thank Dr. Clark for willing the rod of correction across the global history of this world. Thank you, brother, but we got to get to the question of coming quick. I'm a student of African history, and um, I'd like to ask Dr. Clark, too, if he can ex um, explain the difference between what African and so-called African-American um, is and how his, um, what history has to do with um, where we stand as facing this police state and not hang up and listen. Thank you for your call. I mean, he's Africa, African-American and what now? In the difference between African and African-American, I guess is what I think he's saying. Well, the only difference is that, that the African-American was taken out of Africa and he had to adjust to a condition not of his making or his, or his liking. And the African had to also make an adjustment to a colonial right. and, and an Af and a, a condition after slavery. Both of us had to make major adjustments, and there was a debate as to which adjustment was the most disastrous. <laughs> <laughs> Quickly, another question. Thank you for joining us here in the GBE. Good morning. Uh, we have about a minute or so left with Dr. John Henry Clark. Go right ahead, please. Yeah, yeah, good morning. Um, I just want to say that um, if there's anyone best qualified to reason in history, whether African or otherwise, I'd say it's Dr. Hendrick Clark. Because <laughs> I've read his book, um, The African World Revolution, and I was impressed in the way he put so many information in one book that could have been placed in other books. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Thank you for the call. You're in the GBE. We can get one more in for Dr. Clark. Quickly, go right ahead, please. Oh, okay, please, God, brother. Mm -hmm. Brother, I want to ask you how... Hotel to your first name, greet you. Thank Nelson. you, brother. And I want to know how can you make this fundamental in your community as far as after you embrace these religions, for example, I'm a Christian, but I'm not a fundamentalist. How can you... That's the hardest thing to fight. I see even going in the church, even espousing those views mm -hmm. to other people who are in the church who have that fundamentalist view. How do you teach this in your community besides, you know, teaching this to my children myself? But how do you make it prevalent in our communities for each one teach one for our school here and bring it before they get that fundamentalist mindset? 
Okay. You got to first understand what religion is supposed to be. It's supposed to be an instrument of your liberation and not a way of massaging your emotion. It's, it's either must be an instrument of your liberation or you must change it or throw it into the ash can of history. Because religion is not essential to you living a good life. Spirituality is. Mm. You can still have a good belief system. You can still have spirituality. You can still live a decent life without any religion at all. But it is spirituality mm. that lifts man higher than the dog. Mm. And please remember that. Dr. Clark, thank you for joining us again. Always. Thank you. And Dr. Clark is going to be appearing at the Slave Theater. Tonight at 7 p.m. I know you want to be there for more, of course, of the kind of experience that you get from Dr. Clark every day. Those of you, of course, have the books. Those of you who have seen the lectures. Those of you who hear him continue to grow. Uh, of course, I know are following his words closely today for African Heritage Month. In the spirit of Njia, the way we must be every day. We'll take a break. We have news coming up at the top of the hour. In our next uh, segment, we have an opportunity of really segueing into a conversation that is perhaps very appropriate, a nationalist grassroots black power conference from Masses United for Human Rights. Sonny Carson and Omawali Clay will join us in the GBE right after this from 1190, The Choice.